Wait, remember Emperor's New School? It was the spin-off sequel series to the 2000 Disney animated film, The Emperor's New Groove. One of my personal favorites from this period in Disney animation. There's also Krunk's New Groove, the original film sequel, and it's, a. Uh... Fine. But Cusco, here after the events of the first movie and no longer being trapped as a llama, now must become a student at a school named after him, Cusco Academy. Thanks to Cusconian law, to actually reclaim his throne, he must graduate from the academy. So now, rather than worrying about his groove being thrown off, he has to worry about passing his classes, learning to deal with the hardships of high school over the leisure of the high life, what being next in line for the throne really means, and the politics that follow suit, as well as the challenges that come with learning to be a good emperor to his people. So today, let's take a look into the emperor's new school, see what the show had to offer, and where it all led to. We're starving in here. Now a word from our sponsor. Traditional banks are just tiring now. Hidden fees for every little thing, long wait times for customer service, the list goes on. That's where the Albert Debit Card comes in. It is completely different from any bank account that you've ever used. You get 5-20% to back on purchases from places like Starbucks, Walmart, McDonald's, and more. Albert also won't charge you any maintenance fees, or hold you under the weight of maintaining a minimum balance. The best and coolest feature though is the genius features. Stressing over finances is something that so many of us can relate to. Luckily, Albert has a team of financial experts called geniuses. They will examine your personal situations, help devise a plan, and are always available for you if you have any questions. The list of great things Albert does goes on and on. So click the link in the description box to download the Albert app today. On top of all of this, right now for a limited time when you open up an account and connect a qualifying direct deposit, you'll just get $150. Supporting Albert helps support the channel. Thanks so much to Albert for sponsoring today's video. Bring it on! Premiering on the Disney Channel January 27, 2006, the show revisits the modernized pre-Columbian setting. I mean, aside from having the school itself and the practices that reference modern day classes and activities, we have stuff like fast food franchises, pop culture touchstones, and sitcom gags set against the backdrop of stone temples, powerful magic, and an ancient empire. The school itself, like I mentioned, was set up for Cusco to navigate as an average modern high schooler would. Grade levels, sports, cheerleading, extracurricular activities, all the while keeping some semblance of the setting and time the show takes place in. A vaguely 14th or 15th century. Cusco himself, here now played by J.P. Manu instead of David Spade, is an interesting case of a character seemingly reverting back to his original self-centered and selfish personality he once had at the start of the movie. Even though that movie spends its time to do great character development on Cusco, in the show, his lack of self-awareness along with his overly spoiled attitude is back and highlighted more, especially by the trouble Cusco has adjusting to a non-royal life living with Pacha, who in the film was played by John Goodman, but in the show for the first season, he is voiced by Fred Tatashore. But John Goodman does come back for the second season of the show. It kind of plays out as this fish out of water scenario, putting him through a life that he has never known, in a small crowded home and a school life he wasn't prepared for. Pacha does what Pacha does best and tries to truly be that anchor and voice of reason to help Cusco, along with his wife Chicha, played by Wendy Malick. She really takes on this maternal figure for Cusco guiding him to be the better person she believes and knows he is, all the while still having to take care of and worry about her actual kids. Chaka, her daughter, played by Jesse Flower, and her son, Tipo, voiced by Shane Bommel, as well as Pacha and Chicha's newborn, Yupi, in which she was pregnant with during most of the events of the first film. The kids really do treat Cusco as this older brother figure, both helping him out when needed and, of course, messing with him. Speaking of messing with Cusco, a less friendly face or two do return from the movie. First is Yzma, reprised by Eartha Kitt, back as the main antagonist to claim the throne for herself. Now posing as Cusco Academy's principal, this time taking out Cusco academically, rather than with the poison. The poison, poison for, for Cusco. Cusco. And why yes, Kronk does make his return as her henchman, as well as he is disguised as a student to aid in the needs of Yzma. Of course, he is played by Patrick Warburton once more. Luckily though, helping him now avoid the schemes of the evil Yzma is the new character specifically for the show, his fellow student, Melina 
voiced by Jessica Diceco. She's a cheerleader, queen bee, president of every club, and the love interest for Cusco in general for the series. Melina, though, while being a hardworking student and overall good person, doesn't let Cusco get away with distracting her, and will check him for his less than stellar attitude and selfishness when necessary, helping him learn valuable lessons about respect and responsibility, and helping him to pass his classes. As a fan of the first movie, this show had my attention immediately, and it had a fun enough concept to follow along with, albeit at the expense of the character development we had for Cusco in the movie. But I can suspend those thoughts if the show would simply just be fun. But how did this show come to be? Aside from Disney wanting spin-off properties of most of their movies as shows, there was a larger risk-taking aspect on this specific property. Alrighty, alrighty, on with the truth. The Emperor's New School is next on Disney Channel. Emperor's New School continues. So while I myself love the Emperor's New Groove movie, along with many others I know, for Disney on the other hand, they were not happy or impressed with the initial box office returns of the film, costing the studio roughly a hundred million dollars to make. Now this number may or may not include promotional efforts to advertise the movie, which could balloon the cost even further, but the film made a worldwide total in theaters of $169.3 million. While on paper, yeah, that's plenty of millions made. That should be seen as a win. Disney, though, was expecting a bigger return on their investment into the movie. Transitioning from that, the series first went the way of most Disney animated films and had a direct-to-DVD sequel, Crunk's New Groove, which found itself with worse reception and overall less than favorable reviews from critics. So with Disney both disappointed with the first movie and how it performed, and now hit with a slew of negative reviews towards the sequel, Disney had only one logical thing left to do with the franchise. And that's spend more money to make a show for the Disney Channel. One that would have as much voice talent and animation quality for television that they can produce. The confidence in doing the show, however, came from post-box office performance of The Emperor's New Groove. While in theaters they weren't happy with it, the physical release of the film and audience viewing numbers on TV when they would play the movie were showing a massive turnaround in interest for this franchise. This sparked faith in Mark Dindal, the co-creator of the film, and Chris Williams, the story writer of the film to spread their work onto spin-offs of the property, which is why we got the direct-to-home video Kronk's New Groove and, of course, The Emperor's New School. To make the show a reality, though, Bob's Ganaway was hired to produce the series, which for Disney was a logical choice based on his previous work being involved in other movie spin-off TV series, like Timon and Pumbaa, a spin-off show based on those characters from The Lion King, it's a show I will be covering really soon, as well as working on Lilo and Stitch the series, which gave Bob's the unofficial title of the go-to guy for these expansions of Disney movies turned into series. Being good friends and having worked together previously on the 1997 movie Cats Don't Dance, Mark was more than happy to work directly with Bob's again to make this show. Also adding on Howie Parkins, who previously directed shows for Disney like Lloyd in Space and Dave the Barbarian, as well as David Knott, who would go on to direct Making Fiends, but mainly worked on storyboarding for other legacy Disney shows previously like Kim Possible and The Buzz on Maggie. Both of them handling the majority of the directing. Kevin Campbell, writer of Lilo and Stitch the series, Ed Sharlick, writer of What's New Scooby-Doo, along with Mark, ended up being the core of the show's writing team. Now with this production staff assembled, it was time to really flesh out the base concept of what this spin-off show would be. After a while of discussions, Kevin, Ed, and Mark settled on a traditional high school setting, well, as traditional as you could get, for the series to take place in. Feeling that it would allow the creative team the best opportunity to explore Cusco's immature and shallowness through episodes centered around his growth as a character overall, and how he will overcome these problems he's faced with. Also, Bob's was specifically excited for something a bit different in the formula to most Disney properties, and even the differences from the source material movie itself. Discussing that where most Disney animations would usually pair a more serious lead character with a comic relief sidekick, The Emperor's New School would be a bit more unusual in the character dynamic aspect, where the main character is the more comedic and chaotic person while still featuring well-defined side characters. The movie did something similar, just having the main character be the comic relief and the paired-up character of Pacha being the more level-headed serious lead. But there is an argument to be made that the main character of the movie could be Pacha as we really feel a lot of the story from his perspective. Back to the show, however, Bob's was worried, though, that the audience may dislike Cusco, 
because of this decision, but was hopeful that they would see him as more of a sympathetic jerk who may not know any better. The show premiered on January 27th, 2006, not just on the Disney Channel, but on all of the platforms Disney was pushing, like Toon Disney, ABC, and Disney Channel On Demand. It was quite the rollout to make sure that this show was out there and it was seen by as many eyes as possible. But what was the perception of the show? Would it fall the same fate as the movie did in theaters? Or would the love that the movie received on home video and TV push the show further than expected? We've got 15 minutes, come on! We'll be right back to the Emperor's New School on ABC Kids! We're back! with the Emperor's New School on ABC Kids, oh yeah! The show would be received in a very mixed way, with reviews and critics praising aspects like the vocal performances on the show, with Kit and Warburton being mentioned and praised specifically, along with the humor and originality of the series being well received. But pushback came against Cusco himself for his reverting back of character development. It was also criticized for its educational value, worrying that there would be a potential negative impact on younger viewers of the show, and eventually was criticized for a missed opportunity to teach about the historical settings and culture of the Incan Empire, and in general, a chance to teach others about a pre-Columbian era and more. Aside from that, the reviews and reception overall still leaned more on the positive side, with most people enjoying the series as a light-hearted, entertaining comedy. The show would continue on for two seasons with a total of 52 episodes, with the last episode coming out on November 20th, 2008 before it was ultimately canceled. Luckily, the final episode does serve as a series finale, and it wasn't canceled for ratings or reviews as a third season was talked about in a pre-production phase of planning, but sadly, it was actually scrapped for the passing of Eartha Kitt. For Eartha's role as Yzma, she received numerous awards and award nominations for her vocal performance. Her role was deemed irreplaceable. Without Eartha, there was no Yzma. The show for me is one of my go-tos for rewatchability. Aside from just enjoying the movie and the setting of the show, I genuinely still find it funny. The voice acting and comedic timing still hits the same way it did growing up. In fact, maybe even better as an adult as I think it has aged really well. And while the Cusco in the movie versus the Cusco in the show are a bit different in how their responses are given for comedic timing, both versions for me are still great. Thanks to Disney Plus having both seasons of the show on streaming, I've watched through it several times since it has been on the service, and I will probably continue to do so. It's this odd comfort show that brings me a lot of joy at the end of the day. Sure, while they did dismantle the work that the movie did building up Cusco to be a better person, I can still see why it was necessary to break him back down for the show to work. I love what this show did have to offer, and I'm curious as to what you think about this show. Did it work for you? Were you originally a fan of the movie? Let me know your thoughts on The Emperor's New School in the comments. I will be looking more into some other Disney movie spin-off shows coming up. Timon and Pumbaa, like I said, will probably be coming up really soon. So make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. Thanks so much for watching. Follow me on Twitter, and I'll be back soon with another video. But until then, later.